Welcome everyone. It's so nice to see such a nice variety of faces and folks we know and folks from all over the country. And thanks because I know this is not an easy time zone necessarily for everyone. So we're so glad that you're here. Um, I want to do a quick introduction before I introduce our speakers of, and he doesn't know this is happening, Lloyd Anderson, who is our new oceanographic processes professor and geologist. So wave to everybody there, Lloyd. <laughs> So we're super excited to have Lloyd. You can say something. Thanks, Amanda. That was a nice surprise. Um, great to see all your faces. I'm excited to see my new colleagues talk about lionfish, which is something I know little to nothing about. Excellent. Oh, wonderful. And this is, as many of you probably know, just a, a virtual precursor to Alumni Day, which is happening Saturday a week away so um the september 23rd so we hope those of you who are nearby will come on back to mystic and it's nice to be doing that for the first time since covid um, and tonight we're super excited about this talk and so grateful for sophia and tim giving us their time since as you know there's never a monday through friday nine to five week at williams mystic and tim has been out in the field all day and sophia is madly planning field seminars and day seminars next week but um this is a talk that that we are very excited to hear about because as we've already talked about a little bit um lionfish is becoming a big issue we're all hearing a lot about and i also don't know very much about it so um sophia cepeda is our marine history professor or maritime history professor and has been here since fall of 2020 um, so started in that virtual time for Williams Mystic. Uh, her research has focused a lot on issues of gender and welfare in 18th and 19th century sailors and their families and communities. And she's really been an amazing asset at Williams Mystic and also here at the museum as part of the Reimagining New England Histories grant, the Mellon grant that Williams Mystic has been a part of. Sophia has been the co-curriculum or the co-chair of the curriculum committee and that and we've really been thrilled to have her um, leadership on that. And Tim Pusak has been here since the fall of 2017, is Williams Mystic's marine ecologist in his sixth year. And some of what we're going to hear tonight, I think, stems from his um, area of expertise and research from his PhD, from what I understand, working on live fish invasion. Um, and he is an incredible teacher in the field. And what I'm always amazed about with Tim is that he is so energetic and exciting and alert with the students. And then anytime anything bad happens on sort of the back end with faculty and staff, he just takes it as it comes. It's never a problem. The bus doesn't show up at 3 a.m. And it's, you know, he's just like taking a walk in the park. So that is a great, great um, skill to have, which we so appreciate. So I'll let you two take it away. And Lori and I will just kind of stay in the background and chat with us if you need any help or having any tech problems. Sounds good. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so, Sophia, I'll share my screen um, and we'll advance it that way if that works for you. That's a All right. All right. Let me start doing this. Okay. Almost there. There we go. All right. So we wanted to start off with just setting the scene a bit. And I wanted to read an excerpt for you all from um, a kind of representative sample of how we hear lionfish described and discussed. So this is from Kelly Cox's alien invasion article for the University of Miami Inter-American Law Review. Um, and, and Cox writes, um, the scene is set in the romantic subtropics of South Florida. Sunshine, clear skies, a warm ocean breeze, and the feeling of sand between your toes makes the bright blue water seem enticing and refreshing. From the shore, it is impossible to tell, but as each day passes, an alien invasion grows stronger. Their forces have been slowly creeping up the eastern seaboard and infectiously spreading throughout the Caribbean. They are aggressive in claiming new territory. They destroy the areas they do claim, and they kill silently without remorse. Their invasions are lethal, and not even the United States has been able to stop them. 
identified as one of the top 15 emerging global environmental issues, the lionfish invasion has been a devastating impact on the health and biodiversity of our coral reefs. Their alarmingly unabated spread is changing the Western Atlantic aquatic ecosystem as we know it. Tim? Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, that was a very descriptive um, description of the lionfish invasion. And for me, I started my research, uh, doing my PhD in 2007. And that was really the first year that it showed up in the Bahamas in the Exuma chain where I was doing my research. So I went down there having a completely different idea of what I was gonna do for my research. And the lionfish just showed up. And for science, that's a very fortunate opportunity because it's never been there. What are the effects? What's gonna happen? It was rich for a lot of questions, but then concerning because of what we were starting to see in other areas in Florida, as well as in the Bahamas, and then what continue to see throughout the Caribbean. And so I'm gonna tell a little bit of my story and the research that I was able to do in my understanding. Um, but first, I always like to start out with a little bit of background. Um, so really defining what an invasive species is. And this is the definition that I commonly come across of how an invasive species has been introduced through human activity, intentionally or unintentionally, and that they have a documented negative impact on the ecosystem. So for example, the mitten crab, which likes to burrow into levees and burrow into um, the shore and potentially enhan and enhances erosion, they could have a negative effect. There are other um, times when different species come in, these non-native species that are introduced through human activity, but don't necessarily have a documented negative impact yet on the ecosystem. Lindsay Harum, a former alum or an alum of the program, with Jim and other authors, talked about this new um, neopelagic community of floating plastic and all these different coastal species and pelagic species that are living there together. And are they actually an invasive species? This community moving along has the potential to transport these species to new environments. Are they gonna have a negative impact? Because some non-native species do, and they are more termed as an invasive species, but other non-native species just show up and really don't have a large negative impact on the communities that they um, are now a part of. Then there are also just general rain shifts, such as the black sea bass that we're seeing have a rain shift um, up from off the New Jersey coastline, south of Long Island, coming up into New England a lot more prevalently now. And so these are just changes in the distribution of species along an altitudinal, or in this case, latitudinal gradient. Now, one could argue that these rain shifts due to climate change and warming oceans could be an unintentional human impact since we're driving that. So then are these actually invasive species and not just rain shifts? And so these three categories are sometimes useful to use, sometimes maybe shoehorn species into areas we don't need to, because the real question is, what's going to happen when they arrive? Once they're here, what's going to happen? Because some species will arrive and they won't have a negative impact, um, but other species, it might take a lot longer to actually have that negative impact. And so do we wanna wait till they become invasive or is it better when they're a non-native species to then start to remove them so they become invasive? And so the worldwide distribution in 2008 of invasive species, um, this was the last major survey that I was able to find where you see the numbers of known harmful alien species, they call them here across the globe. And so you can see there's certain areas where there's really high, usually where there's lots of shipping, a lot of um, vessels coming in um, in Europe, on the west coast of the United States, Hawaii, the Mediterranean, other areas have fewer known harmful invasive species. There hasn't really been a worldwide survey since then that I could find, but um, Siebens et al. looked and found projecting to 2050. What is it going to look like? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? And you can see across invasive species, both terrestrial and marine and aquatic here, that we see that they've been increasing um, across different continents and are projected to continue to increase. That as we continue to move around the globe, shipping's really big, people are moving around, these other species are following. And so it's predicted that invasive species will continue to move or non-native species and where they become invasive is a key question because when will they become invasive and how long will they actually be there or until they become invasive? As you can see on here, we have what's known as the invasion curve where early on, down on the left side of the screen in that green, that there's very small numbers, that there are small numbers in small areas infested. And this is the time period when you can actually eradicate. You can remove them because there's just not many of them. 
Now, we don't know if they're invasive usually at this time because there's just not a lot of them, so they might not have a large negative impact. But then as that population grows, it's usually through exponential growth and spread, so local abundances as well as geographic spread, containment might only be possible. And then really, once they are really established and widespread, it's long-term management. How are you going to manage because these species are established in the area, and can we actually control their numbers to some manageable level so they don't have as large a negative impact as they potentially could? And so people have asked these questions, how bad are invasive species? Are they really a major cause of extinctions, drivers of ecological change? How should we judge these species? And really what I want to pull out of this is, yes, there are invasive species, they have negative effects, but really you have to do the science to understand what those effects are. And it's critical to get that information in order to then make good management decisions about how you want to potentially try to control them or the most effective ways to control them as well. So let's look at the Indo-Pacific lionfish. Um, so in that quote that Sophia said, that came from this um, horizon scan of global conservation for 2010. Um, Sutherland et al. put these out every year. And in 2010, which was right smack in the middle of my dissertation, the lionfish were one of the global conservation issues, which can you, as you can imagine, for someone trying to get grant money was a great way for me to say, yes, we need to study this. Look, it's an issue for global conservation. And because we began to see some of the negative effects and actually document them, and we're pretty worried about these lionfish spreading throughout the Caribbean on already degraded coral reefs there, another stressor on already stressed out coral reefs due to many um, potential threats. And so in 2008, my lab mate, Mark Albans, um, he did the first study to look at how lionfish were affecting native reef fish communities. And he did this on some small little patch reefs that we had um, off of Lee Stocking Island where we did my research. And on the y-axis, you see recruitment or just the numbers of small reef fishes. These are either fishes that are um, pop their adult populations, individuals are below five centimeters or when they're little baby fish below five centimeters. And so he had reefs where there were both lionfish and reefs without lionfish. And it lasted for 10 weeks, as you can see on the x-axis. And as you can clearly see, those control reefs with no lionfish, we had numbers of small reef fishes slowly increase on those reefs. This is what you expect over the summer recruitment season. Babies are being made, little fish are coming in, more fish are occurring on the reef. But on those reefs with lionfish, you see there's a drastic decline. This is about an 86% change um, from up around 36 to about five or so. So you can see where lionfish were, they were eating lots of reef fish. Um, I've been to many science conferences and we, Mark presented this at the big coral reef conference in Fort Lauderdale. Um, ICRS that year, and it was the only time I've actually ever heard an audible gasp in the audience speaking at a science conference, that they were shocked that there was this large of a difference with this predator on the reefs. And so talking a little bit about the invasion, that sighting started off the southeast tip of Florida in the 80s, you'll see these red dots start to show up. And throughout the 90s, they appear throughout Florida. Southern Florida has many Pacific species that live off there. But lionfish, as you can see in 2000, began to spread quite wide. You can see in the early 2000s, they jumped to the Bahamas, and then they rapidly spread throughout the Caribbean along the coast of South America. And so you can see they extend up the eastern seaboard, up here in the Mystic and Rhode Island. They can't overwinter here, but we do find them in the summer. They usually die in the winter. And so you can see that quite rapidly, over 40 years, they've spread throughout this entire region. And there's wondering of how far they're going to continue to spread down the South American coastline, as well as if the waters are warming, are there going to be permanent populations above Cape Hatteras, which is about their northern extent? And there have been questions, can they somehow get through the Panama Canal and have a secondary invasion into the Pacific in areas where there normally weren't? Because as we'll find out in a bit, they can live in freshwater systems as well. So lionfish spreading rapidly across many different areas. And so they're native to the Indo-Pacific. You can see in the green areas here, this is where Taroas volatans is. Miles is in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. And that in the red, this is their invaded range. And what's interesting is that they're very rare in the native range. These two species of lionfish are two of many lionfishes that are out there. I think there's 16 to 20 different species. And they are incredibly rare 
people feel lucky when they're able to see some of these in these native ranges for them. And so it's quite interesting that they've been able to colonize so quickly and so fast and be in such high densities in their invaded range because something is not controlling their populations. They're also prolific spawners. An individual female can produce about 2 million eggs per year. They produce, reproduce about every two weeks, a couple hundred thousand eggs. So during the recruitment season, they can create a lot of little baby lionfish. And they usually create a little egg mass, which floats in the water column, and then an egg mass breaks up, creating little pelagic larvae. And they eventually settle out at about two centimeters in many different habitats. The smallest lionfish I caught was about two and a half centimeters. They look really cute and cool when they're that small, um, but they can be very prolific spawners. Lionfish, one of their famous attributes is their venomous spines. So they have 13 dorsal venomous spines. They have two pelvic spines and three anal spines that are all venomous. And so these have glandular tissue inside of them that when they stick into flesh releases a toxin, which causes anywhere from the worst bee sting that you possibly felt to potentially nerve damage, huge inflammation, or I haven't heard of too many really strong reactions where you have anaphylactic shock, but it's pretty painful. I have permanent nerve damage in my thumb when I got stung by one reaching into a freezer, which is often for scientists when you get stung is handling them outside the water. Um, but they have these venomous spines, which will deter some predation. But as they're living and existing in their environment, they have a lot of cryptic coloration that they just hang out on rock walls and ledges and they just kind of waver their fins, um, their dorsal um, spines, their pectoral fins, just kind of wave. They look just kind of like algae waving in the water. They don't look like other native predators in the Caribbean region. They don't hang out that way. Lionfish hang out in the open, don't really care. And that they have different behaviors. So hopefully these videos come across. They might, some might be a little grainy, but we'll go with it. Can you see this, Sophia? Can I give a thumbs up? So as you can see, turn down my bubbles. Uh, the lionfish just hang out and they're just waving there, just drifting as algae. And so this is often where you see them during the day. They're digesting a lot of their food, um, hanging out on the side there, kind of looking for their next meal if they want to hunt. We would often see them hunting in the seagrass where we saw them pick off small little juvenile fish, about 20 in a minute for a small wrasse species. But they don't behave like other predators. Oops, but they are incredibly efficient predators. So we're going to watch some video of them being efficient. Um, and so here we see a lionfish in the center. And this is how they orient themselves when they're hunting. So there's a little goby or something on the sand there. And he is angled down pointing. His pectoral fins are spread wide. He's kind of angling it into a trap spot. And in a moment, if you can see, he's flushing his gills. He's actually directing jets of water at the goby. And we think they do this for two reasons. One, to disorient the prey fish because he's dealing with a lot of water coming past his head. And then also when fish get a current, they orient themselves head first into the current. So then this facilitates swallowing of the fish because then all the spines fold down on the back and they can quickly swallow whatever um, prey item they're eating. And you can see they're waving their dorsal spines there and then they can attack quite quickly. So here we see them still blowing those jets of water. You can see that goby about the same size as the lionfish. And the maximum we've seen is that lionfish could eat a fish up to about three quarter of its body length. So I saw a four centimeter lionfish bite a three centimeter goby and it took about 40 minutes for it to stuff it down into its gut. And then it just had this huge extended belly. Here, just seeing that all the jets of water coming, you'll begin to see some sand move by the goby right here. And so he's really trying hard. He's probably confused right now because that goby's in a tube to see why isn't this goby moving? I really want to eat this fish. Why isn't it moving? You can see he's slowly getting closer. And thankfully for this goby, he won't get eaten. But you can see how much water that this lionfish is moving as he's getting close. Um, Mark Albans and Patrick Lyons, some colleagues of mine, they published this, that this was a unique hunting strategy um, to blow these jets of water. It hasn't been seen in other predatory fish um, before or since. So it's kind of a cool adaptation that they have. 
And one final video that I always like to show um, this is a high def slow mo video. And you'll see how this fish really has no chance. Because as they get bigger fish, those blowing jets might not work, but then they rapidly can expand their mouth to create a vacuum of water to suck their prey in. And you can see that that fish never really had a chance. This was about a 20 centimeter lionfish. So lionfish are efficient predators. They have a defensive um, array of spines. They don't look like anything else that is present on these reefs. Um, and that because of these reasons, they're probably a good invader. One thing I didn't say is they're also pretty hardy. That lionfish, there was one that we saw that had a spear through its back. It had a hole about a centimeter wide. And over the summer, that hole healed right up and it was fine. We eventually did sacrifice it to look what was in the stomach, but it survived with a hole you could clearly see daylight through. So these are very hardy creatures that can eat a lot, breed a lot, and aren't really seen as a food item by native predators. So they make a good invader. So let's look at some of the data. Our big question was how will lionfish affect the native community? This was a really big question that we were trying to establish early on in the invasion. And so one of the ways that we wanted to understand this was how do they behave in the Atlantic versus the Pacific? So I was involved in a study where we partnered with the University of Guam and Catherine Curie. Um, and we did similar studies both in the Pacific and the Atlantic to see how they differ. Why are they so prolific in the Atlantic? Why are they so abundant? And this was a challenging bit of research because in the Pacific, as I said, they're rare. So it's hard to convince areas, let us do research on a rare species that's native there. Whereas in the Atlantic, it's very easy to do research on lionfish because nobody wants it there. So one of the studies that we first did was study their growth rate. How fast are they growing? And so in this figure over here on the left, you see you have initial lionfish size on the x-axis and growth rate in millimeters per day on the y-axis. We had two invaded sites, the Bahamas and the Caymans. And we had two sites, the Mariana Islands and the Philippines. And what we can see here is that the solid line and the dashed line are the invaded sites, and that they're always higher than those in the native range, the Mariana Islands and the Philippines. And once we get to these larger sizes, the lionfish greatly decreased in the um, native range, but we see lionfish in the, in the Atlantic, the invaded range, grow about two times as fast. This is a really large difference. And so if you take this information, this mark recapture data, because we gave them these small little elastomer tags so we could monitor individuals over the summer. And we modeled them using a Von Burton Lafley growth curve. We see that it's predicted that those lionfish in the Atlantic can attain a larger maximum size over their lifetime. And this is what anecdotal reports have found. We see fish that are much larger and that grow to that larger size much quicker. And the thing about fish that grow fast, the faster they grow, the bigger they get, the faster their mouths get larger, which means they can eat more fish quicker. And so they might have even a disproportionate effect in the Atlantic than the Pacific of fish that they can eat. So we also wondered about their behavior. So we did a lot of in situ monitoring from as soon as the sun came up over the horizon to just before it went down and monitor their behavior. What are they doing? Are there differences between the invaded range here on the, or here on the right and the native range here on the left? And what we saw in both areas was that they have crepuscular behavior, that the hunting in these um, solid black triangles, so they're more active in the morning times and the evening times when they're out hunting, which is common for many predators who hunt during the twilight hours, and that during the day they're often inactive. The Philippines and the Caymans tend to have been deeper sites, Guam and the Bahamas tend to be shallower sites, so we saw a stronger pattern in the shallower sites, but the same um, from the excuse me, in the native and the invaded range. So they're hunting about the same, they have the same behavior. So it's not like they're hunting all the time in the day in the invaded range. But what we did find is that in the native range, they use this blowing behavior more, blowing these jets of water less in the invaded range. And to us, this suggested that they had to do more in order to eat food, that the in the invaded range, they could just go around and eat whatever they wanted they didn't have to employ the secondary hunting technique. They could just come up and swim to eat the um, 
prey items in the invaded range. So they had to do more, suggesting that maybe native prey items recognize them as predators. And other people have looked into this and they think that there's um, some prey naivety, that prey don't even recognize that lionfish are a predator to be wary of. Um, and so they were able to see over here that they employ this secondary hunting effect. I'm not gonna show the data, but another result of this study was that they had a wider diversity of prey items in the invaded range, so they could eat more of them. In the native range, they were eating fewer species, probably because they couldn't just eat whatever came across their face, which is what they did in the invaded range. And so our second large study really tried to figure out how will lionfish interact with the whole food web here? They're a mesopredator because that's about the size that they are, relatively small compared to top predators. So they're similar in size to other small bodied groupers like this coney grouper here. There are larger predators, sharks in the area, larger groupers, eels. They could potentially interact with territorial damselfish, which have been shown to increase diversity on these reefs as they protect their territories. Interact with other important fish species such as cleaners who clean and also increase diversity on reefs um, and reduce the number of parasites on other fishes as well as some ecologically important fish, such as juvenile versions of parrotfishes, which tend to eat macroalgae. And if they're affecting the herbivores of macroalgae, how are then they potentially affecting the corals? So I won't be able to talk about all this. That's about a two hour talk, which I'm not gonna do, but I'm gonna pick a few to talk about. The first, we'll look at how lionfish compare to other mesopredators, this coney grouper. And what we see, there'll be a couple of figures that look like this where we have once again change in N, this is the number of small reef fishes. So the number of those little juveniles that are showing up or just small fishes that live on the reef over, oops, sorry, back one more. Over the time this in weeks, this time it was an eight week experiment. And so we have a couple different treatments here. We have these control reefs in the filled in diamonds here where there were no predators, we removed all of them off. We had reefs where there were just groupers only, these coney groupers, the native predator. Then we had reefs with lionfish only, the open circles, and reefs with grouper and lionfish. So trying to tease apart what is the grouper effect on these small reef fishes, and then that combined effect having both predators there. Is there potentially some negative interaction? And what this figure is showing that when you just have native predators on the reef, that they are very similar to the number of small reef fishes when there's no predators. So native predators do eat some, it appears, but not enough to have such a large effect that they're significantly different from those on the control reefs. However, when you have a lionfish either by itself or with the grouper, they're still eating a ton of those fish. That we see they're significantly different, much less, and in some cases, there are actually fewer fishes on the reef at the end of the experiment than when they started completely wiping out any of these um, recruitment season of adding new fish. So we see that lionfish do have a much larger effect than the native community, the native predators do. So we see that they're more effective against native predators. Well, how do the top predators interact with lionfish? I mean, this is one area where like, all right, if there's something that's gonna control lionfish, these predators gotta eat them because top-down control can occur often, especially on these coral reefs where large predators can exert a large effect. And so what, um, what Hackerot did is they went to all these different reefs around the Caribbean, talked to a bunch of scientists and compiled a whole bunch of data where they looked at total predator biomass. All these large groupers, Nassau grouper, tiger groupers, large goliath and black groupers. And they wanted to see, is there an effect on lionfish density um, or um, on the biomass? And what you see here is there was no effect. It didn't matter how many total predators, these native predators were there. It wasn't like there was always less lionfish that were there, that there was no discernible effect on them. So it doesn't appear that native predators are having effect region-wide. However, there was some effects that we were able to document on a much smaller scale. So Ellis and Megan Folletti were able to do an experiment on the red grouper which lives in these depressions in the Florida Keys. And this is a similar figure to what we've seen before, where we have time on the x-axis and the recruit abundance, the number of small reef fishes. And what this is looking at is, all right, you have this predator on the reef and you have a lionfish. 
is there an effect of that large predator on the lionfish's behavior to eat these smaller fishes? And this one, we had red grouper alone, so we didn't have a control reef without any predators, but red grouper typically don't eat small reef fishes this size. And we see that small reef fishes increased over the summer. We've seen this pattern before. When lionfish are alone, this dotted line with the triangles, they eat a lot of the small reef fishes. However, when there's both predators or no predators on there, that there is significantly more small reef fishes than when just lionfish are there, <laughs> but still less than when just the red grouper are there. So this suggests that red grouper have an effect on lionfish because when they're present, there's more small reef fishes there. So lionfish aren't being as an effective eater. There's some sort of interaction because there was no predation of red grouper on lionfish that was observed. But there's some interaction where red groupers prevent lionfish successfully hunting. And well, I guess we see here that when there's red groupers there alone, that they do a really good job of protecting this little depression, which is about, I think it was about one meter in diameter from other predators coming in to eat the small reef fishes. I did a similar study on the small reefs that we've seen before, but this time using Nassau groupers. And for Nassau groupers, I had a range from zero up to five Nassau groupers on these small reefs. And so once again, I had those control reefs without predators, lots of small reef fish show up. Lionfish only reefs, they eat all those small reef fishes. And when, when there was low grouper abundance, one to three groupers, we see that there was no effect of those groupers. But once you got a higher density, four to five groupers on these reefs, that the number of small reef fishes was not significantly different than that recruitment. So that we're seeing a lot more small reef fishes moderating the effect of lionfish when you have lots of groupers. And what we thought is these lionfish are like, or these groupers, are kind of like a whole bunch of puppy dogs on the reef. And puppy dogs with one tennis ball that they're all running around to chase. There's little holes and these groupers chase each other back and forth throughout these holes. Now, if we saw before with the lionfish, how they hunt, they're slow hunters that are moving all around, slowly stalking their prey. You have a bunch of groupers swimming around. It definitely reduces their success rate of being a hunter. So that's what we think was happening. It's called an immensalistic relationship where there is a negative effect on lionfish, but the groupers could care less that the lionfish were there. If we scale this up to a much larger, because these small reefs were about four um, square meters um, in area, but on a much larger reef area, we saw that lionfish still had an effect. So this was done by Stephanie Green. And so looking at lionfish abundance on some reefs over on Eleuther Island, that over the years there was very few lionfish and then they drastically increased. Um, looking at the log lionfish abundance, so this is on the log scale. And over this time period, it looked at the percent change in biomass of small prey, small non-prey, large prey, or large competitors and large non-competitors. And what you see is those that are either competitors or prey had a 50% reduction in biomass, but those fish that weren't prey, whether they be small, um, cleaner gobies, which have a toxin on them, or a small puffer fish, which also has a toxin, so they're not generally prey items, we didn't see a change. So it wasn't like there was an overall decline in the um, prey abundance, just really those fish that got eaten by lionfish. Mark Albin saw a similar thing, where that there was on those reefs that had high lionfish density in red, we saw a reduction in the number of um, small reef fishes there. Whereas those reefs where lionfish was relatively low density, these were large reefs where we'd remove lionfish every three months. So there's always a low density, not zero. So we didn't see as large effect there, but we were able to see that lionfish are having effect on the large scale, on the really larger scale. And importantly, after a whole year, we saw this effect on those herbivorous fishes. So mainly those parrot fishes were seeing a reduction. So what stage are we now? We went back to these reefs in 2015. We haven't been back since, but we had been counting lionfish in these areas since 2005. My advisor had been going here since the early 90s. They never saw lionfish before then on small artificial reefs, small natural reefs, larger reefs, medium-sized patch reefs. And this is what we're seeing. These are the densities of lionfish that we see that exponential like growth on these reefs. But when we went back in 2015, there started to be a decline. 
there started to be a reduction in these lionfish. And so we wondered in this area of the Bahamas, was the invasion waning or finding a uh, more equilibrium of how big the lionfish densities would be? We haven't been back since. I'm really curious to go back to see what the lionfish populations are doing, um, but it's really hard to go there. The research station that we went to no longer exists. So it's much more challenging to try to get and do all this underwater research. So what do we know? We know a bunch about how lionfish are affecting native predators. We know how they're affecting potentially these other reef fishes. I didn't talk about it, but there's a bunch of research on how they're affecting cleaners and other parasites um, and territorial damselfish. We don't yet know how they're affecting corals and it's hard to tease apart lionfish from other stresses like climate change, sedimentation, things like that on corals, but that still remains a question. So let's think about the human side. And so for this, I'm gonna pass it over to Sophia. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, representing humanity here. Um, so as you may have noticed from Amanda's introduction, um, my specialty is not lionfish um, or invasive species. Um, I have not mistaken North Atlantic sailors for lionfish. Um, but what I want to do in research, I often focus on the relationship between kind of what something is, how they're talked about, both in public and kind of in, in private, and how they're then kind of regulated or governed. And so Tim has given us a lot of real, a lot of great information on what lionfish are and what's happening with them. And I wanted us kind of together to explore this, this next piece of how they're being talked about and what sort of the effects of how lionfish are talked about might be. And to also think about, might there be any kind of parallels we see in the language used around lionfish and other kind of contemporary or historical concerns and issues. So this is a situation where I'm going to present you all with some of these primary sources, uh, and then I'm gonna ask us to talk about it a bit. So get get ready in a few moments to, to do the raise hand and, and unmute yourselves, because I wanna hear what you have to think think and say as well. Um, so the big thing we're thinking about here, like I said, is you know how does, or what impact does the media's language have on your understanding of lionfish? So we're gonna go to the next slide, Tim. Um, and does it remind you of language used to describe any other topics? So in a moment, um, we're gonna go to the next slide and we're gonna look at examples from news media. So we're gonna look at um, basically clips, sometimes just titles, of newspaper articles, both online and print articles that are talking about lionfish from roughly 2011 to as close as 2023. The sample size that I looked at in, in pulling these quotes was just over, I think, 50 articles. There's a lot of repetition that you'll see when you get into these sources. A lot of people just pulling the same kind of AP wire story and reprinting it. Um, but we'll also see that these are um, national publications and local publications um, and those sort of wire stories um, as well. So we got kind of a, a diverse sample set. Um, so the first one I wanted us to look at is from 2011. This is one of the earlier examples of reporting on lionfish and it's titled, A New Predator Stalks East Coast Waters Lionfish devour native species, experts fear wide habitat damage. And then we see how the author William E. Gibson is talking about lionfish for this public non-scientist audience. Um, and Gibson writes, beware the lionfish, the pretty but voracious aquarium favorite, which has been gobbling up other reef fishes throughout the Caribbean is swimming up South Florida's estuaries, invading the Gulf of Mexico and spreading along the South American coast. Scientists say the East Coast has never seen a mass marine invasion of this kind. Lionfish have reproduced with abandon. In the Bahamas, they decimated native fish and disturbed the habitat for corals. The federal government is looking to human predators to take up the theme, if you can't beat them, eat them. All right, so that's what we're seeing in 2011, some of these earlier publicly aimed articles talking about lionfish. Tim, can you go to the next slide? 
All right, I'm seeing what happens when you put animations in, in Google Slides on Zoom. This is a good lesson to learn for the future. Um, so the next article comes from 2014's um, Christian Science Monitor publication by Noel Swan, as East Coast waters warm an invader moves in. And again, we're seeing the language used to describe the lionfish. So thinking here about how is that shaping how the public might be understanding lionfish. Warming ocean waters could be a boon to invasive marine species such as the dazzling but rapacious lionfish. In the years since their introduction off the Florida coast, the lionfish has made itself at home, voraciously consuming native species and threatening the stability of coral ecosystems. They have become firmly established along the southeast coast. Stephanie Green's research suggests that warmer temperatures could also accelerate the lionfish's colonization rate. Um, so again, right, seeing, well, I'm not going to spoil it. We're going to talk about what we see in that language in a moment. All right, so Tim, next slide. All right, and just a couple more, a slightly longer excerpts here, and then we're going to just get a, a whole bunch of titles that I think are, are pretty illustrative of the broader point here. Um, okay, so Lorenzo Matiga for the New York Times in 2022 wrote, Behold the lionfish as transfixing as it is destructive, uh, going on to write, It feels cruel to kill something so hypnotically beautiful, and yet killing the fish one by one is perhaps the best way to slow the havoc they're wreaking on the Caribbean reefs. And then for you wire text, we have this, uh, you know, no author attributed more wire style article here, non-native invaders lionfish attack Pensacola's marine ecosystem, writing these fish reproduce at an alarming rate. The population increase has the potential to devastate the local reef habitat and health. The lionfish invasion is a battle that has been ongoing for several years now. There are initiatives and steps being taken to lower the population, such as lionfish tournaments and derbies. And then if we go to the next slide, um, you will see just kind of a quick rundown of some of these headlines from 2009 to 2019 in chronological order. Um, and we have new pirate of the Caribbean invades from Pacific, taming the lionfish, Florida fights back against invasive species, war on invasive lionfish in Atlantic waters yields first good news. Lionfish characteristics make them more terminator than predator. Lionfish terminates native species in Atlantic, Caribbean, a troublesome fish lionfish, nasty critter, tasty lunch. And then finally, latest weapon against lionfish invasion, meet the Roomba of the sea. Um, and we're gonna get into, we actually have a, a video of that um, just a little bit, a little bit later. Um, but uh, before we, we get into um, some of that management piece that uh, I was referring to earlier, I wanna return to this question that I opened with of just what impact is the media's language having on kind of this framing of the lionfish? How are they framing the lionfish for the public at large? And I will go to a bigger gallery view so I can see more people. And if you wanna keep your camera off, that's fine. Um, but thinking here, so how are lionfish being talked about? What are you noticing? as we go through these lists. And Tim, actually, if you wanna go back to the slide so that they can see that list of headlines, I think might be a helpful place to sit. You want this slide, Sophia? Um, hold on, I made it so that I, I can't see this slide. <laughs> okay, wait. yes, that one's perfect, thank you. 